Let's talk about the motion of a charged particle inside a magnetic field. The force that that charged particle feels is sometimes called the Lorentz force, and it's given by this equation right here. That magnetic force is equal to the charge times the speed or velocity of that moving particle times the magnetic field times sine theta. And that angle theta is the angle between the velocity vector of the particle and the magnetic field vector. So what I have here is an example or a diagram of what one of these uh, problems might look like. So we have these x's here, and all of these x's represent a magnetic field that is into the page or into the ground. So the magnetic field is pointing down into the ground, right in this direction, perpendicular to the sidewalk. Okay? And then here we have a charged particle that's executing circular motion inside this magnetic field. And so each one of these blue dots that represents a, port, a place along this path of this, of this charge. And uh, the uh, vectors that I've drawn here, these green vectors, those are the velocity vectors of that charged particle as it's going around the circle. And these velocity vectors are always uh, tangent to the edge of the circular path here. Okay, And the direction of that magnetic force that this charged particle is experiencing is always pointing directly inward towards the center of this circular path. So the magnetic force, F, is always going to be directed inward. So the magnitude of this force is not going to change, but its direction does change. Just as the direction of these velocity vectors changes as the particle is moving around the circle, but the magnitude of that velocity does not change. So how do we know, really, which direction this uh, magnetic force is pointing. One way we can look at that is by using the right-hand rule. There's a couple of different ways you can use the right-hand rule, different methods depending on different textbooks that you use. Your textbook use a dis uses a different method than what I learned, but we will go with it here. So to use the right-hand rule, you take your right hand and your thumb points in the direction of the velocity vector, okay? And your fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field vector. So I'm orienting my hand like this. Sometimes you have to be a bit of a contortionist to do this. So here, my fingers are pointing into the ground in the direction of the magnetic field vector. My thumb is pointing in the direction of the velocity vector, which is this way. And my palm tells me the direction of that magnetic force. So here, um, the magnetic force is always going to be perpendicularly outward from your palm here. And so wherever I place my hand here, magnetic field vector into the ground, my thumb pointing in the direction of the velocity vector. And so at this point right here, my magnetic force is going to be pointing here in this direction, perpendicular to my palm, pointing inward towards the center of that circle. So that's how I know, using the right hand rule, by putting my uh, different parts of my hand in the direction of the velocity, field and magnetic field, which direction that magnetic force is pointing. And so that's always pointing inward towards the center of my circle here. And that magnetic force is always determined by this equation, the charge of that particle times its velocity times the magnetic field sine theta. Theta is that angle between the velocity vector and your magnetic field vector. So in this setup that I have right here, the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector are at 90 degrees apart from each other. And so sine of 90 degrees is going to be 1. So sine of 90 is 1. So if you have a pretty simple setup, then your magnetic force is just going to be the charge times the velocity vector, times the magnitude of the velocity vector times the magnitude of the magnetic field vector. Okay, so let's think a little bit more about the motion of this particle, and in particular, let's think about how we could figure out what the radius of this circle should be, the radius of this circular motion that this charge is going through. So 
uh, earlier we said that um, here we've got the magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the direction of motion of the particle. So the angle between V and B is 90 degrees. So sine theta will be 90, sine theta is 1. So we can rewrite the magnetic force here as QVB. Now this magnetic force causes this particle to move in this curved path. And remember from last semester that we can also say from Newton's second law that F is equal to ma. So this force is also equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration of the circular motion. So this magnetic force is contributing to create this centripetal acceleration that this particle feels in the circ circular path. Okay? So we can set these two equal to each other. So we can set QVB equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Now, the centripetal acceleration, we can also write as V squared over R. R is the radius of our circular motion path. Now, we can solve that equation for the radius of this circle. And if we do that, we find that the radius is equal to the mass times the velocity of the particle divided by its charge times the magnetic field. And so, again, it's this magnetic field that's causing this circular path and the centripetal acceleration. And so from this equation here, we see that the radius of this path is proportional to the momentum of our particle. Remember that momentum is the mass times velocity, and it's inversely proportional to the charge of this particle and its magnetic field. So then sometimes this equation here is also called the cyclotron equation. And um, if the initial direction of our magnetic, or sorry, if the initial direction of our velocity of this particle is not exactly perpendicular to the magnetic field, then this charged particle actually executes a helical path, not a circular path. So the path of this particle that I've drawn here is going to be exactly in the plane of the ground here um, because V is exactly perpendicular to B. But what if V was not directly perpendicular to B? Then you would actually get the particle still executing circular motion, but it would be doing it in sort of a helical path. And so it would go around, and then it would go up and up and up and up and up and make this beautiful helix pattern. Sometimes similar things are occurring, let's say, for instance, on the sun. Um, the sun has these giant arches of magnetic field, and particles are circling around them in these circular radius paths. They're executing helical motion around these giant arches of magnetism extended above the sun's surface. And so, of course, I'm going to be drawing that comparison because I study the sun. <laughs> I want to talk about a particular application of our cyclotron equation and that is a mass spectrometer. Maybe you've used one in one of your other classes or you've talked about mass spectroscopy. So a mass spectrometer is used in many different fields to analyze the constituent components of a sample. So the sample is injected quickly into a magnetic field and then the path of the particle is curved by that magnetic field. And measuring the radius of this path is one important component in identifying this particle's mass per charge ratio. And this ratio is known for a wide variety of elements, compounds, and molecules. So you spin something into a mass spectrometer, you're able to get its mass per charge ratio. You compare those to a bunch of known mass per charge ratios, and then you're able to identify the parts of your sample, what your sample is made up of. And so the important thing for a mass spectrometer is um, the, the device here is gonna measure our radius r for this curved path. We have a set or defined magnetic field within the mass spectrometer, and we set a value for the, the velocity of the particle within the mass spectrometer too. So you get r, you figure out what v is, you apply a b, and then you can get a mass per charge ratio. Okay, so this is an example of what we have here. We have an ion source, so we stick our um, sample in there, and then it spits out a, a quickly moving um, piece of that sample. 
it moves through this section called velocity selector, which I'll talk more about, and then it enters into the main chamber of the of the mass spectrometer. And um, you can imagine that maybe there's a permanent mag magnetic field here, a permanent magnet that's applying a magnetic field. That particle feels that um, magnetic field and it executes a curved path within there, which gets detected by the mass spectrometer. Okay, so here I have the magnetic field pointing out of the board toward us. Okay. And so when my particle, let's say it's a positive particle, is moving inside this magnetic field that's pointing out of the board toward us, we can use our first right hand rule. So our fingers are pointing out of the board and then my thumb is going to point in the direction of the velocity of that particle, okay? And so fingers out of the board, thumb in the direction there. And if this is a positive uh, particle, positively charged particle, then the force vector, the magnetic force vector, is going to point out from my palm here. And so then the magnetic force vector is going to be pointing inward. <laughs> Draw that. Um, inward toward our circle here. So that's my magnetic force vector. Inward towards the circle, center of the circle. Okay? And then we've got the radius of this curved path. And so here would be the radius, or two times the radius, for our first mass here, you send out something that has a different mass, it executes a, a different path curvature, and so this would be two times its radius right here. Okay. So we apply a B, that's known. We calculate or we get a detection for R from the mass spectrometer. We have to apply a V so that we know what the speed of that particle is. And you do that here within this component called the velocity selector. And in the velocity selector, we have a magnetic field pointing out of the board. Here we have an electric field that's perpendicular to that magnetic field, so I've drawn it pointing off in this direction. And so the thing about the velocity selector is that um, if we fix V for all particles, then the radius of the paths that they make in here will be directly proportional to their mass. And we have our magnetic field and electric field vectors here perpendicular to each other. The only particles for which Fe, the electric force on that particle, equals the magnetic force acting on that particle, only those particles are going to be able to travel through a velocity selector in a straight line and then enter into our main chamber of the mass spectrometer. So here in our velocity selector, we have a situation where only the particles can get through into the main chamber of the mass spectrometer if their electric force acting on them is equal to the magnetic force on them. And remember, we can write the electric force as Q times the electric field, and that equals uh, the magnetic force, which is Q, the velocity of the particle, times B, assuming that the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, okay? The charges cancel, and so then the velocity we know of which our particles are going through here that are able to make it through the mass spectrometer are only those, the velocity equal where the electric, um, the velocity is equal to that electric field divided by the magnetic field. So then that gives us our velocity that we need here in order to get our mass per charge ratio. Hi, we're back outside again, and I wanted to talk about something called the Hall effect. So the magnetic field also affects how charges move inside a conductor, and one result of that is called the Hall effect. So right here I have a conductor. The conductor is between these green lines here, and my conductor is inside a magnetic field. And the magnetic field here is pointing into the ground. That's what the X means. The magnetic field is pointing into the ground right here. And the current running through this conductor is pointing off in this direction. So if we know that the current in my conductor is moving in this direction, then my electron, which I'm denoting right here with this red dot, must have a drift velocity in the opposite direction of the current. And so my electron is actually going to be heading off in the opposite direction that we define the conventional current 
So if I use my right hand rule here, I put my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field into the board and I put my thumb along the direction of the magnetic field. Now the thing about um, the right hand rule is that the direction that my palm is facing, that would be the direction of the magnetic force for a positive charge. But for a negative charge, the direction of that magnetic force is actually on the back side of my hand or on, on this way on the top side of my hand on the opposite side. So the direction of the magnetic force is not going to be pointing in this direction like it would be out of my palm. For a positive charge, it's going to be actually pointing out of the top of my hand in this direction for the negative charge. So this particle is feeling a negative charge, or sorry, a negative um, magnetic force that wants to point it upward, move it up to this top edge here of this conductor. And so all of those electrons then, when they're feeling this, they're, they're in the current and they're um, experiencing this magnetic field pointing into the ground, they have a magnetic force that's going to be immediately pointing upward here. And so all those electrons are going to want to come up and pile up onto the top side here of this conductor. And they're going to build up a negative charge on this side of the conductor. Okay, and so that means there's going to be a charge separation. So the other side of my conductor is going to have a positive charge. And so what happens when you have a separation of charge in a conductor, we saw something like this when we were talking about capacitors. And whenever that happens, we set up an EMF, a potential difference across these plates here, okay? And so now we are, we've built up an EMF, and this is what we call the Hall EMF, okay? And um, it's um, because we were able to create the separation of charge when we have this conductor with a current running through it um, inside a magnetic field, okay? So although this magnetic force moves negative charges to one side, we cannot build up the charges on these uh, conductors on the edges without limit. And so the electric field caused by this charge separation opposes the magnetic force and the electric force acting on this electron here eventually grows to equal it. So eventually we will reach a state where the, uh, the electric force, which we can write as the charge times the electric field, equals the magnetic force acting on those particles, which is equal to the charge times the velocity of that, those uh, particles, uh, the electron, times its magnetic field, okay? So the charges cancel out from each other, and then you're left with just this expression that the electric field is equal to the speed of those electrons, this would be the drift speed of the electron, times um, the magnetic field here. Okay, and if we remember back from uh, one of our earlier chapters when we were talking about electric field, that whenever we have two, um, two parallel plate capacitors, for example, um, the electric field between those two parallel plates is equal to that potential difference across those plates divided by the distance between those plates. And we can also write that as being equal to for instance, in this uh, setup that we have here, being equal to our EMF that we've induced divided by what I'm calling L here, which is the, um, the width here of my conductor that I've drawn here. Okay, and so we can rewrite this and say that since these are both equal to E, that the, um, the velocity of, the drift velocity of the electrons times the magnetic field is equal to our induced Hall EMF divided by the width of my conductor. Okay, So VB is equal to our epsilon, which I'm representing as the Hall EMF, divided by the, um, the, the, the width of this conductor here. And so we can solve that for the induced Hall EMF, and the EMF is equal to the speed or the drift speed of those electrons times the magnetic field times the width of my conductor here. And so finally we arrive at our equation for the Hall EMF and this is a special case where the plane of my conductor and the direction of the velocity of my charge 
and the magnetic field vector are all perpendicular to each other. So this is a special case. And so our Hall effect here again is the voltage or the induced voltage that we can set up across a conductor of width L through which moves some charge with speed B. Now the Hall effect was really useful for us and it actually was the thing that was used to determine that electrons are the charge that carries current, not positive charges. And there are devices called Hall probes which are used to measure flow based on the EMF that this flow can produce. And some examples of Hall probes can be used to measure blood flow through blood vessels, but they can also be used to measure fluid flows in large laboratory experiments.